So here's two unforgettable things. I'm sure you've all heard these. Uh, Einstein said e equals mc squared, and Thomas Edison said Mary had a little lamb. Um, both of those were said over 100 years ago, not in the same decade, but, but quite a while ago. And they're both very significant statements uh, for the world that we live in today. Uh, obviously, e equals mc squared underlies our uh, our view, our understanding of the physical world and of nature. And for example, for me as a particle physicist, uh, it, it informs everything we do when we think about nature and when, when we measure things. Um, Mary Had a Little Lamb is, in, I guess you would call it a nursery rhyme or a, a poem, but um, it's the thing which Edison famously claimed to have said into his phonograph the first time that he heard a voice uh, actually reproduced by a machine. So that's an incredibly important event, too, because it's, we can sort of trace back the beginning of our uh, information technology culture in some way to that moment or some other moments of similar in part, you know, around the same time, uh, Alexander Graham Bell and the telephone, uh, Samuel Morse and the telegraph, and so forth. So Mary had a little eye on the sound, not so heavy as equals mc squared, but still um, very significant. Uh, both of these men, uh, obviously, their thoughts and their uh, ideas have informed uh, what I've been thinking about, so I like to bring them into the picture together. <clears throat> so, as a particle physicist, um, I am very interested in elementary particles and understanding their behavior. And the way we do that as physicists is uh, trying to actually see them and uh, understand how they move count up for what they do, uh, look at their distributions statistically, and so forth. And in particle physics, you know, you can sort of trace it back to the, around 1900 when people first started recognizing that there were element, elementary particles. And uh, the way we would look at particles, particularly in the older time, was essentially through photographs. We found ways in which particles could change the appearance of materials, and by looking at them with photography, we could actually uh, image them. And so, um, at some point, I learned about something which ma many, many people are familiar with, which is the idea of mathematically extracting information from images. And I was really thinking, you know, combining the process of mathematically extracting information from images and getting images of particles, you know, maybe we could do something that would be a little bit uh, powerful. And so, just to kind of give you what this idea of image processing or digital image processing means, I bring up this picture. So. This is my 14-year-old. He doesn't go to this high school. He goes to a high school in San Francisco. But um, here he is. And um, the question that, if you're a parent, that you probably ask most frequently about a 14-year-old is, where is he? Okay. And <laughs> in this case, the answer would be bail. But mathematically, what I really want to know is, where in the picture is he? And I can apply some techniques to this picture to extract that information. And essentially what I want to know is, where are his contours? Because if I can find his contours, then I can ask some sort of a question about, well, where's the middle of it all, or something like that. And the way we find his contours is by applying arithmetic to every single pixel in the image. We do a little mathematical transformation. And in this case, the transformation is we take each pixel and we exchange it for its value minus the value of all the pixels in the little group around it. And when you do that, if you've ever taken calculus, it's essentially like taking a derivative. It just picks up the transitions, the places where the image is changing. When I do that, it becomes very, very easy for me to get information out of a picture. So I want you to keep that in your mind, that there are pictures give us a lot of information, and mathematically and with computers, we can get information from pictures through pretty basic techniques. Here we go. I was driving in a car, uh, commuting back and forth between Silicon Valley and Berkeley, and I was listening to KQED, and there was a uh, discussion on with this man. His name is Mickey Hart. He's a rock musician. Some of you may have heard of him. But in addition to being a rock musician, he's very committed to what he calls song catching, or the preservation of the world's music. And he's written a book, which you can find, called Song Catchers, where he talks all about this. And what he said in this radio show that I was listening to was that <clears throat> sound recordings are of great historical value. There are many of them. 
they're endangered because they're on materials that don't have a long lifetime or may not have been stored properly or may be broken. Um, the way they're made is extremely diverse technically. There were all different ways over the years that sound was recorded. And he actually put all this down in a paper that he wrote and then he published in the journal. What is sound? So sound is a periodic um, compression and rarefaction of, of a medium. So when I'm talking to you, you're hearing me because there's a pressure wave that's going through the air and impinging on your ears. The pitch, I mean, if I was to try to sing a, a note, okay, the, the pitch would be related to the period of that wave. And the volume, you can hear me here, is related to the amplitude, what the excursion is about the mean pressure of the room. So that's kind of how sound works. And a complicated sound, like say a chord, is really just created by adding up all the separate sounds and putting them together. So the linear process, we just add all the different tones together and we get the more complicated sounds that kind of make the world a rich place from an auditory perspective. You know, I thought, well, if you have sound recordings that are on soft materials or broken or delicate, maybe we could use photography and optically digitize the information on a recording and then write a computer program that would analyze the, the recording, the image of the recording, and play it back rather than actually ever physically touching it. And so, you know, this is a, a, a picture that's supposed to evoke in, in some great detail a little tiny piece of recording and I'm going to ask my computer, can you tell me what sound um, this pattern that you see on the screen corresponds to? So, <clears throat> in order to do that, uh, I really needed to know what what, it, what do these sound recordings really look like? Really look like means how big are these are these um, features in the surface that, that encode the sound? You know what's what's actually their character? So <clears throat> if you take one of those tinfoil recordings of Thomas Edison, this is say from 1878, um, and you and you ask the question, you know, how big are those are those variations due to sound? So I've got those two red lines that I've drawn. So one red line is in the direction of time. Okay. The other red line is is uh, across the the, uh, the direction. So the way you should think about this is, is what Edison would have done is he would have taken that strip of foil and wrapped it around a cylinder, and he would have played it by rotating as a kind of a, a spiral pattern as he went around. So time would be this direction. So along the time direction, this is what the surface looks like if you, if you look at it microscopically. It varies in this sinusoidal way, and the amplitude of the variation is about 50 microns. So let's let's get that straight. Uh, one micron is a thousandth of a millimeter or a millionth of a meter, okay? But a better way to think about it is, according to Wikipedia, the average human hair is 50 microns in diameter, okay? That's the average. Some people have thicker hair, other people have finer hair, but 50 is kind of a good average. So. <coughs> So sound is recorded, is encoded in, the, in that surface by a variation that's moving up and down by about the width of an average human hair. If I look across, um, the, the sound is, in, is, is stored in a little groove, and the depth of the groove, again, is of order 50 microns, and the, and the, the depth of the groove is just moving up and down like, a, like, like the valley floor uh, if you're hiking up in the mountains. Now, by 1930, people had obviously <coughs> abandoned tinfoil, because probably none of you have ever seen a tinfoil uh, recording, but you have seen probably the phonograph record that I alluded to before. So there, the groove um, is more like a river, it's going from side to side instead of up and down. But if you actually ask the same question, you know, how big is it? Uh, it's, about, it's about 80 microns deep, so a little bigger than that, and it moves back and forth by from fractions to tens of microns from side to side. So that's the scale, it's microns, it's human hair sort of dimensions. But I really need to know in great detail um, uh, how, how that is actually moving from place to place in order to figure out what the sound is without touching it. So I need scientific instruments that would actually do that. Okay, so the question for me at the time, you know, when I started thinking about this is, are there instruments accessible to me, that would be fast enough, that would let me actually do this? So the answer, of course, is yes, or I wouldn't be here talking to you about it today. But 
it was a bit of an odyssey that, that took place in our lab when we started thinking about this to see if we could find the instruments that would actually do that. Okay, so here's the process. We take a phonograph record or a cylinder or, in fact, any material pretty much independent of its shape and size and character that has sound that's been mechanically impressed upon the surface. And we mount it inside a system that includes various optical instruments that let us measure the character of the surface with sufficient detail that we can get that millionth of a meter scale of information off the surface, okay? So this is, think of this as a sort of generic, good enough optical device. And we scan it across the surface, and we pick up, in fact, those, those variations from place to place. And we put them all together and create, this is just a tiny little piece of it, but we cr create a huge topographic map, like you might get at REI or someplace, you know, a map that shows the hills, the dales, the valleys, the cliffs, the fissures, the mountaintops, and every feature of the surface in such detail that we could, we could actually get the sound off it. So we create such, a, such a, an image, it's huge, it's gigabytes of data, and then we put it into a computer, do an algorithm that examines the surface, calculates how it would actually have been created by virtue of the sound, and then creates a data file that we can put into an audio format and play back. Now, to do that, we gave it a lot of thought, we wrote a paper about it, called Reconstruction of Mechanically Recorded Sound by Image Processing, 2003. So we sent it to the Library of Congress. The Library of Congress engaged with us because they thought it was an interesting thing to think about. This led to a lot of discussions and funding and projects and so forth, which eventually um, has come to be a machine, which we call Irene. And there are five of these machines now. There's one in Berkeley, two in Washington, another near Boston, and there's one in India. And in fact, it's Got all the computational characteristics, the measurements, and everything you need to optically scan both the cylindrical and the disk recordings and other formats as well and extract the sound. Next, I'm going to go back now 46 years. Okay, 1860. Everybody knows Thomas Edison invented the phonograph. Well, this Frenchman, Leon Scott de Martinville, actually built a machine to record sound on paper about 17 years before Thomas Edison. This machine um, couldn't play the sound back. And that's why I singled Edison out instead of Scott. And also because Einstein and Edison sounds better than Einstein and Scott. But now we're going to jump 18 years ahead. This is Thomas Edison. This is his early phonograph. And this is the oldest recording of an Edison tinfoil that's, that's yet been played back. It dates from 1878. It's over a minute long, but it's got in, in, in it the iconic Now, probably you couldn't quite make that out, but maybe by the cadence you could tell that it was Mary Had a Little Lamb, okay? Uh, a few years later, we go to Washington, D.C., and Alexander Graham Bell uh, and his colleagues developed a machine to record sound on wax-coated discs. Okay? This is a recording that's the only known recording so far restored of Bell's voice itself. Okay? So you're going to hear Bell, and I want you to focus on the end where you're going to actually hear him say quite vocally, hear my voice. And I've given you the text so you can follow along. thing I want to play for you um, is, is um, an example of what's called a field recording. And this is something I'd really like you to take away from this uh, talk. 
By 1890, researchers in anthropology, linguistics, ethnography realized that sound recording was the key to capturing information about world cultures um, that some of which would disappear. And there are now many, many tens of thousands of recordings, one-of-a-kind recordings in collections all over the place that um, were recorded from 1890 to, say, the 1940s, which cover um, a huge spectrum of the world's cultures as a huge change was going on. Okay? And I'm just going to play one of them for you today. And this is from the UC Berkeley collection, and it's a recording of a man named Ishii. I'll bet you most of the uh, students here know who Ishii is. You've heard the story of the last Yahi, and this is an actual recording of him that was collected by Professor Krober. Okay, so finally, I just want to say, sound recordings um, are a record of our culture. They're not just records, they're a record of our culture. We can use science and technology um, to preserve and create access to this part of our history. Um, the potential exists today for really large-scale projects to non-invasively digitize entire at-risk collections. The hardware that I showed you has sits within an operating and analysis framework that is really set up to deal with large collections and the transfer of them in a very systematic way. Um, a colleague of mine, uh, Bill Viet, says, our ultimate audience is posterity. I think that's a great way of capturing the, um, you know, this imperative. Um, if you go to this website, it's real easy to remember, irene.lvl.gov. There's lots of stuff you can listen to and, and um, information about, about this work. So here's all the uh, institutions that supported this and have been involved in it, um, mostly public funders from the federal government, Library of Congress, the National Endowment of Humanities, and so forth. Thank you.